Okay, we're all good. Welcome back everybody to New Testament class. Today we um, are going to have a presentation from Helen later. But first we'll look at the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is an important book. In the book of Hebrews we will get a lot of our New Testament insight in old, to the Old Testament. This is our main thing we're probably going to focus on. Uh, because this is a lot of what you hear people just throwing around about Old Testament blah 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 blah. A lot of it comes out of Hebrews. And so we don't probably realize most of what we get about Old Testament. It comes out of the Hebrews, because basically the Hebrews is someone going through the Old Testament explaining how um, the New Covenant fits into that New Old Testament. What was that, Josh? Yeah, over a cup of coffee? Over a cup of coffee. <laughs> possibly, possibly not. Is it, could you, well, Hebrews. Could you so, Hebrews. Yeah. Yes, very good. Okay. <clears throat> we want to be aware three guiding passages. <laughs> we just made some really bad jokes. So yes. Gloria is so disappointed. <laughs> 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 okay, so let's have Josh, how about you find Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, without introductory scripture, Helen, Colossians 2, 16 to 17, and Lauren, 1 Corinthians 10 to 11. Yes, that's correct. These are get us started on First Corinthians ten eleven. How are we hand this give us an insight into our New Testament perspective on the Old Testament? Go Josh. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, for when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the map. Do you get that that's talking about? What is that talking about? The tabernacle and how God gave him specific instructions on how it was to be built, what yeah. materials to be used. What um, was the, where did the instructions come from? What were they based on? Based on? They serve at a copy. You see, they, 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 talking about the priests, when in the tabernacle, when in the temple, they serve in a copy of the real. Okay? So the temple on earth is a copy of something that's real. The temple is not the real thing. It's a copy of something that's more real. Heaven? The one in heaven, that's right. So Moses had to make it according to the pattern that was shown him because he says in that passage, they serve, the Levites serve at a copy of the real the one that's in heaven. Um, so that old thing is all, it's all a copy of the real. Go, um, Helen. Uh, Colossians 2, 16, 17. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is a Okay, so the other things are a shadow. The Old Testament things are a shadow of the substance which is found in Christ Jesus. First Corinthians 10. Eleven. Yeah. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us through down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Yeah, so the so there's a couple of things that we use the Old Testament for. One, they're examples to show us. So we look back in the Old Testament and we see examples basically of how people act and whether that was good or bad and how God acts. So we get examples from the Old Testament. Um, we have shadows in the Old Testament, and the reality is found in Christ. We have a pattern. We have patterns in the Old Testament, pattern, human patterns, earthly patterns of the reality that is in heaven. So these are the sort of things that we have when we're looking at the Old Testament. These are the things we have to have in the background all the time. Remember, we looked in Job and we saw a pattern of someone who suffers, right, and someone who's suffering unjustly. And we that pattern is repeated again and again in the Old Testament, and it's pointing us to a reality. Job is not the goal, finding Jesus and having experience in Jesus and our suffering. That's the goal. So the, the pattern is always the pattern points up to something more substantial, which is normally in Jesus. Okay, let's read. Gloria, how about you read us Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4? Give us an introduction to the book of Hebrews.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.
It is only a short letter. Go. So I wonder how long it would take to read it out. 13 chapters. You'd probably do it in an hour. So that's not a long sermon, right? <coughs> not bad. But okay. But when you're used to 25 minutes. It's not brief. It's not brief. It's brief. Brief is a relative word, obviously. Cultural gap between us and them, right? This is brief and simple. Okay, let's look at the argument of Hebrews. What does he talk about? First, he says, Jesus is greater than the angels. We just we were just getting into that, right? So because it's an, not a letter, he's already starting to make his first point. God spoke to us before, and now he's speaking to Jesus. Jesus is much bigger than all the angels. And then we get a couple of chapters of saying why Jesus is bigger than the angels. And we get Old Testament scriptures telling us why Jesus is more important than angels. And then we have Jesus is more important than Moses. And we have comparisons between Jesus and Moses and scriptures about Moses and how Jesus is more important than Moses. Josh. What is cultist? I knew you were going to stuck on cultist. <laughs> religious system. So the Levitical religious system is all of the sacrifices and offerings and ceremonies that Levites do to connect with God. And the, the practices, ceremonies, and the things that Jesus has brought in are much better than the Levitical ones. Okay. So so does that mean like all of the like the Nazarite, uh, and yeah. the Levitical, like, mm -hmm. all of that is like left behind and abandoned? Um, okay. Well, what do we think? Have we discussed this at all in class yet? No. We haven't. Okay. I think we I'm there. sure we must have talked about this by now. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get there. We may have. But okay. Know. We'll get there. But that's a really good question. Um, so Jesus' religious system is much better than the one that the Levites had, and Jesus' followers have more faith than other people have. So therefore, don't give up, don't turn back, don't rebel, and don't disobey. This is not a soft encouragement, by the way. This is quite a harsh exhortation, warning, some stern, strong warnings in there, um, which we'll pick up. We want to understand there's a Greek argument for greek reason philosophy that comes through again and again in here called arguing from the less to the greater so if a small thing is true then the bigger thing is obviously more true an example of that would be if the people that go to center point church right if they are into um if they are if they are humorous and fun well their senior pastor must be hugely humorous and fun right and it would, imply, it would imply that if the attend the congregation members at the church have a, are fun, then the senior pastor of the church is way fun. Okay? And, if the senior, and the reverse is also true. If the pastor is fun, then his people at his church will also be fun. Okay? If, one is, if it's true for one, significant, then it's true for the followers. If it's true for the followers, it's even more true for the leader. That's the sort of argument you will see um, in Hebrews all the time. And that's a standard Greek philosophy argument. If something is true for me, theoretically, it's also true for all of Australians in some way or another. That's the sort of logic that they are using. <laughs> okay, we'll get started on Jesus and the angels. Let's have a look. Let's read some scriptures about this. Jesus and the angels. The, the argument for you, where's the scripture we will use? Um, there's a scripture which I haven't written down where it says, God gave the law through angels to Moses, and Moses gave it to the people. This is one of the, this is chapter two of Hebrews. The law given through angels was punishable by death. If you disobey Moses, right, that law came through an angel. Okay? Now, and you got punished for that. Right? Now the law, the covenant that we have now, the message we have now didn't come through an angel, it came through the Son of God himself. Jesus is more important than an angel. So if disobeying an angel got you into trouble, disobeying Jesus will get you into bigger trouble. Is the, um, that's the argument that comes out at the start. Um, because Jesus is way more important. If you have disobeyed Jesus, that's worse than disobeying an angel. Um, and so this is, that's chapter one, pretty much summarized Jesus is bigger than an angel. Um, and he quotes from the Psalms, to which of the angels did God say, you are my son, Today you have become my father. It's a psalm. Uh, and he says, God never said that to the angels. And so this is this whole thing about Jesus is more important than angels. And that's covered in the first two chapters. 
Then we have Jesus is more important than Moses. Let's read Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Yeah. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house. If indeed we hold up our hold fast our confidence and our boasting in hope. Okay. If indeed, okay, so the differences between Moses and Jesus. What's the difference between Moses and Jesus in that passage? Yes. Yes, so Moses is a servant, Christ is the son. There's a big difference between son and the servant. Yeah. And Moses is in and Jesus is over. Right? Jesus draws as a son over God's house, Moses is a servant in God's house. So there's a big difference between Moses and Jesus. Uh, and we'll see um, again and again references to how Jesus is more important than Moses. Jesus does for us what Moses couldn't do for us. Moses was not able to bring people into the rest. Let's look at let's look at these this whole thing about um, see Hebrews three um, eighteen to nineteen. There's this whole big argument about resting in God and entering in the rest that God has promised. So Helen, you can do three eighteen nineteen. Um, Gloria, you can do chapter four one and four, and then Lauren four nine and ten. Nine ten. So we want to get this idea. What is he talking about? Um, God's rest. Okay, go. 3, 18 to 19. And to whom did he swear that he would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Do we know what we're talking about? Context? Who's talking to who about what? Do we need to read more? I would say that it would be uh, talking about the rest of Now let's go back a bit because we want to get the whole flow of the argument. You, Hebrews is a lot of long logical arguments. It's talking about the Israelites, yes. What couldn't they enter into? They couldn't enter the promised land. Why not? They were too scared. Because they disobeyed, right? So it's reflecting back on when they came to the promised land and it was time to go in and they said, don't, we're too scared, you know, and they had to go in the wilderness for 40 years. They didn't enter into the God's rest because of their disobedience. There was a place for them that God had prepared for them, which they did not enter into. Okay, um, so let's go to chapter 4, verse 1 and 4. And 4 or 2, 4? 5. 1 and 4 or 2, 1, 2, 4 will be fine. Okay. And we still have the promise that God gave to those people. That promise is that we can enter his place of rest. Okay. So one, there's a pro God. The pro God has promised rest for His people, which is still available to us today, even though they didn't enter in. Yep. So we should be very careful that none of you fail to get that promise. Yes, the good news about it was told to us just as it was to them, but the message they heard did not help them. They heard it but did not accept it with faith. Only we who believe it are able to enter God's place of rest. Yeah, okay, so people back then heard the promise, but because they didn't obey, they didn't have courage to obey, they didn't enter into the promise that God had for them. Now we've had the same promise given to us. Yep. Okay, on the seventh day God rested from all his work. What are we referring to now? Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, right? I love it that the guy goes, this great scholar goes, somewhere in the Bible he says something yeah. about, like, hey, we all know Genesis chapter 1, even he doesn't know that, right? This is very encouraging for us. So, when we have the promised land, we have the promised land, and the promised whiteboard marker. The promised land is called the rest, 
and it's the promised land, right? And then we have the Sabbath rest, um, seventh day, that creation. God rested. And it's the, it's the same thing. These are all talking about the same thing. The promised land, they were supposed to rest after slavery, after being hard, hard driven by slaves for a long time. This was their chance to rest. The promised land was when the slavery would end and they'd come to rest. They had their, they'd be resting. God rested on the seventh day from all his work. Okay, he rested on the seventh day. Same. And this is all together in the same thing. Four, nine, and ten. Which shows that the seventh day rest for God's people is still to come. God rested after he finished his work. For everyone who entered God's place of rest will also have rest from their own work, just as God did. Okay, and we all enter God's rest just as God rested from his. So we can do that, right? What he's saying is we can enter God's rest. When we enter God's rest, what do we do? We rest. <laughs> we stop working, right? What 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 is the comparison that he is making? What is the rest that God has promised for all of his people? Come to me, all of you are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. When we rest like God rested on the seventh day, we will rest like they rested when they promised land, but they didn't, because they didn't have faith. If you don't have faith, you can't rest. When you do have faith, you do rest. You stop working. What is the rest? Exactly. Resting. We rest when we're no longer working to try and because we all know the rest of us think he's arguing about is you're abandoning. We're abandoning Moses. We're abandoning the Levitical priesthood, all that sort of thing. We've got a better priest, all of those things. So we're leaving all of that behind. We're no longer working to get God's favor. We're resting. And this resting is the same as entering the promised land. And it's the same as the Sabbath. The, the implication of this whole point is that the whole point of the Sabbath is actually to show us that we will rest like God rested. And the way we rest is we stop working to try and get favor with God. And we also are no longer in the bondage of the devil driven as slaves because the devil is the slave driver. We're not under the slave driver who's driving us, but now we're resting. And God is not a slave driver that drives us, but he grants us, gives us a rest place. Uh, and so, remember, Old Testament is patterns and shadows. The Sabbath pattern and shadow is a shadow of resting and not working. Primarily, not working to please God, not being driven by the slavery of the devil, but in a place of rest. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Jesus was talking to Jewish people under a great burden. What was the great burden they were carrying? They, were, they, they, they had sin in their lives, but they also were carrying the yoke of the law, compliance to the law, and all the associated extra things that had been added on by generations of Pharisees. And they were also under the yoke of Roman slavery, so they had a whole lot all going on at once. But Jesus didn't come to do away with the Roman slavery, but he did give them rest. And so there's a whole understanding of rest, the rest concept. The Sabbath, the primary underlying message of the Sabbath, this is pointing to Jesus, like everything else in the Old Testament, but because he will give, bring us rest. And he gives us rest when we're not working in slavery to the devil, not in slavery to sin anymore, and we're not striving and working hard to please God. He's given us a place of rest. He's given us a place of favor. He's given us the place where we can dwell um, without us having to earn it. Those, this is the, these are the promises that were wrapped up in the Sabbath thing. The whole fact that it's beneficial for us to take a day off every week and rest and all that sort of thing, that's sort of collateral. The main point is that we live in that place of rest. And this is a, this is a, the whole concept of rest and work is a big deal. Because for example, you'll notice here that it says, and I was reading this passage out to at home, and at both two people from my house came back to me at different times and said, oh, hold on a minute, you've got that wrong. Because, okay, because, because I was singing even when I can't see it, you're working. 
Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working, right? We all sing that song, Waymaker. Oh! You never stop working, right? What is Josh going to say right now? Heresy. Is it heresy? Yeah. Why? Because he learns. He did stop working. So where did that song come from? Who had they make that up? Did they just pull that out of the sky? My father, Jesus said, is always at work. So I too must work. They came to Jesus and said, you're healing people on the Sabbath. Stop working on the Sabbath. He said, my father is always at work. And I must work. Because my father is always working. But... Oh, exactly. wait, 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 wait. Does that mean that even while you're resting or in a place of rest, you could still work? Yes, that is what it means. Jesus was always working. Language God language. is always oh, working. What are we talking about now? We just notice what sort of work was Jesus doing? What was he doing? His father's, his father's work. work. He was not working for himself. He was working for his father. Oh, okay. The day was still centered around God. So He's still it doing <laughs> his father's work. Paul said, I work harder than anyone. But not me, the grace of God working in me, right? So Paul works very this does not this not mean laziness, right? Because it's not talking about activity. No. It's talking about a, where our spiritual where we dwell, where we live spiritually. It's a posture of rest. It's a posture of rest, that's right. But God is always working. What's God doing right now? What's God's work? What is he doing in the world today? Uh, he's holding everything together. <laughs> he's holding everything together. He's sustaining everything. Oh, <laughs> God is what is God with God is healing and delivering and restoring and all of that sort of stuff. He's reaching the lost, restoring the broken, and releasing the lost. <laughs> Very good. Awesome. Reaching rescuing the lost. Reaching the lost, restoring. Rescuing the lost. Rescuing the lost. Restoring the broken. Wow, okay. Well, I was close. That's why I remember having this conversation like half an hour ago. So, so we had God is always at work and Jesus is always at work. Night is coming, can you see when no one can work? But right now, he's always at work, right? And so Jesus is always working, but it's finished. God's week's been finished. We see this two things going on. But we're not doing our own work. Our, our place is given to us. And because of what has been given to us, we are now working, doing the Father's work. Living in the house that the Father has made with the resources the Father has provided. That's the whole thing that's going on with work and rest. And so, yes, two people come to me and say, hold on, you said God has been working, but now you're saying that he never stops working. It's all about context. It's all about getting an un getting understanding. Right, so cool, right? Love that. Okay, moving right along. Jesus' way is more important than the Levitical way, right? There's logical arguments all through, chapter after chapter, of arguing. Jesus is a better priest than Melchizedek. Who knows who Melchizedek is? So, we're going back to Genesis. Abraham... Lot gets kidnapped, so um, Sodom gets invaded. Lot gets captured along with everyone else, taken away as hostages. Abraham hears about it, gets together his people, they go back, Ray, capture, deliver, rescue them or bring them home. Melchizedek comes out. What does he come out with? Melchizedek comes out with bread and wine. No, 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 my new testament. Ariel's going off, bread and wine. And he blesses Abraham and says, Blessed be God most high, you has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham pays a tithe of the victory of all the spoils in the battle, gives 10% to Melchizedek. And so this, the writer of Hebrews says, just think a minute, how important Melchizedek is. He's more important than Abraham because the lower person pays to the higher person, right? Okay, that's interesting. Now, the Levites collect the tithe from the people and they pay it, okay? They collect the tithe from all the people, right? Now, the Levites, Abraham is the ancestor of the Levites. As an ancestor of the Levites, he is paying the tithe, not collecting the tithe. He's paying the tithe to someone greater than himself. 
So, so obviously, Melchizedek is much more important than Abraham. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and the greater person blesses the smaller person. Melchizedek is so much more important. What else do we know about Melchizedek? Well, we've got no idea on his genealogical background. We don't know. He's got no ancestry. It's, how did he become to be the priest? We don't know. He's the priest of Salem, which means the priest of the king of peace and the king. So he was from Jerusalem, right? Salem, Jerusalem. He was the king of Salem, king of priests, and king of peace and king of Salem. That's what his name means. And he says to him, Jesus is our high priest. Turn off that battery. I believe so. Awesome. It wasn't showing that Well, we'll find out in a minute. Maybe that battery's a little bit faulty. Now we've got no battery. Hmm? What's volunteer week? What's volunteer week? We have a lift meeting on Friday. We have a lift meeting on Friday. Yes. Oh, is that right? Oh, that's a good thing. Every week is volunteer appreciation week, right? Okay. So. Wait, when did we announce? Did you guys talk about uh, lifts? Yeah. 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 Oh, hold on, we're getting the, the conspiracy theories are rising now about Melchizedek. <laughs> now, we know Jesus um, is a priest, is our high priest, right? Jesus is not descended from Levi. He's descended from Judah. Nothing in the Old Testament says anything about Judah being a priest. The Le Levites are supposed to be priests. So Jesus is, and then in the Psalms, David says, you are a priest forever of the order of Melchizedek. So the Hebrew writer grabs his thing. In the book of Psalms, it says, the soul arm, well, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, I'll put all of my enemies under her feet. You are a priest forever on the order of Melchizedek. You are my son, and today you become my father. He grabs all these scriptures. Jesus is like Melchizedek. Okay? He doesn't become a priest because he's descended from Aaron. Okay? That's not, that doesn't matter. He becomes a priest because he has an indestructible life. Um, that's how he became a priest. And Jesus is after the line of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. So Jesus is much more important than the Levites. They pay tithes to him. There's the, the logic that goes on in this whole argument. Um, very, very um, cool in the way they do the argument. Okay, then he says, let's read um, later. Then he says, they have the sanctuary that the Levites serve at is a copy of the one in heaven. All right? So the temple we've got now is a copy of the one in heaven. They go in every year and they present sacrifices, right? First one for themselves and then one for the sins of the people when the country is watched clean again. Da, da, da. Jesus went one time into the real sanctuary that's in heaven. Not the copy, but the real thing. And he didn't present animal blood. He presented his own blood. Once forever. And the whole deal is done. He didn't have to do a sacrifice for himself because he had sinned. But he brought his blood as a sacrifice for the whole world, bring forgiveness and cleansing forever um, on, the, on the real altar in heaven before the real father and so it's a done deal once and for all rather than having to do animal sacrifice every year to cover yourself as well. And then he says if you get a new priest now you, what you get, you get in a bucket all together you get the priest, the law um, everything comes together and go and now you've got a new priest therefore you need a whole new law to go with the new priest and so there, this is why the whole Levitical system is now obsolete and fading away. Because there's a new priest with a whole new law code coming in. And that's Jesus. And his new law is how much better than the old one. This is, um, this is Hebrews summed up very quickly. Let's read Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. That can be Helen. And 9, 11 to 14. That can be Josh. And 7, 11 to 13. That could be Gloria. 
So we can now, our priest has gone into the, we can go on into heaven. And now he knows what it's like to be us, that he understands what it's like to be human, because he's been a human. How good is that? But he has made a way for us. We can all draw near with confidence and boldness because of what Jesus has done in going before us. Yes, that's good. Right, 9, 11, 14. For when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then uh, through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternity redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the Lord? Okay, an animal sacrifice cleanses you for a year. How much more powerful is Jesus' sacrifice cleanses you forever? So what answer of what's going on in that one? Very good. 7, 11 to 13. The people were given the law under the system of priests from the tribes of Levi, but no one could be made spiritually perfect through the offering of the animals. Therefore, when the priests offered the Yes, so that's what we said. Jesus is the high priest, order of Melchizedek, and the new law comes in. The old law never actually perfected anybody. And because of our own sin, we could never, it could never quite do its job. But the new law um, is totally different. It's totally much more effective because it's got a new priest. Let's look at some of the exhortations in Hebrews chapter 2. This is where it gets hard. Okay, Hebrews 2, 1 to 4. Lauren, you can read that one to us. Um, you can do Hebrews 3, blah, 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 all those ones. Helen, Hebrews 4, Josh, Hebrews 5, Gloria. Okay, Hebrews 2, 1 to 4. So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through the angels has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this? Yes, we must pay attention. We must listen. Okay, and we the angel. if you ignore the angel, you got punished, and Jesus himself has brought this word. So we should pay attention. Don't think we can get away with it if we just ignore what God is saying. Okay, Hebrews 3. So I'll put in. Yeah. Who was 3? I was 4. You were both 4. I was 3. Well, Helen was 3. 12 to 14. Okay. Three. Um, so 3 1, 12 to 14. Yeah. Hebrews 3 1 to 4. The word, brethren, that lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold to the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Hold on to the end. Don't give up. Um, chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Ah, uh, yes. So the key thing here, which we, we hear this all the time, hearing the word is not enough, you've got to have friend faith to the message. We've all heard the message, 
But not all of us have had faith. And without faith, it's not going to do us any good. It did them no good. It'll do us no good unless we believe the things that have been spoken to us. Okay. 5, 11. Who's got 5, 11? Or 6, 8. Is that long? 5, 11. Yep. We have many things to tell you about this, but it is hard to explain because you have stopped trying to understand. Oh, yes. You have had enough time now. Sorry. You have had enough time that by now you should be teaching, but you need someone to teach you again to first us in the cross teaching. You still need the teaching that is like them. You are not ready to follow the food. Gentle, corrective word here. Sorry? Yeah, keep going. Anyone who is on the list of a baby and is not able to understand much about them in life. But solid food is for people who have grown up. From their experience, they have learned to see the difference between good and evil. One of the foundations that he then goes into, he says, Therefore, let us not lay again the foundation of. This comes back to the foundation teachings for all believers. What are the foundations that he then says? Does anyone know? You can read it out if you like. These are standard foundation, foundational teachings that someone needs to know. Turning away from evil within the past and believing God. Oh, is that turning away from evil? Yes. The heathens, yeah. The heathens the past. Yeah. And believing in God. Faith, yeah. Baptisms. Baptisms. Laying hands on people. Laying hands, yeah. Resurrection. Yeah. Resurrection. Talking about that. I mean, about that. Resurrection of the end of general judgment, right? Yeah. Repentance, faith, baptism, laying hands, resurrection of the end, and judgment. These are the foundational teachings. Communion? Not on that list. No. no. The foundational things that the writer of the Hebrews said, these are things you should all know by now. These are the mill for the babies. Um, these are things the babies need to understand. You should all know this by now. Why they have to take it all again? Right? Repentance. From dead works, okay, that's repentance from sin, but also repentance in their situation from Levitical rituals, okay, works that achieve nothing, works that are dead, faith in God, baptisms, what are the, what are the baptisms? Water and Holy Spirit, that's right, well, Pentecostals, we said Holy Spirit first, how amazing is that? <laughs> Holy Spirit first, is everyone a very good baptism in the Holy Spirit? Laying on of hands, what's laying on of hands about? Praying for people, healing. Praying for healing. What else? Uh, deliverance. Freedom. Deliverance, yes. Um, establishing of leadership. Laying on of hands for a leadership position. Or appointing appointing yeah. leaders and parting spiritual gifts. Yes. Laying on of hands, yes. Resurrection of the dead, foundational topic. What does that mean? What? Jesus raised from the dead. Resurrection of the dead? Yeah, but it says people who have died. All people who have died. Read it to me. No, the, read the sentence. Resurrection of all people who have died. The resurrection of those who have died. Yes. So the teaching that every person will be resurrected, right? That they will be. Every person will be resurrected, yes. There's a resurrection that awaits every person. Um, foundational teaching, which is not is universally that, accepted by all people, is right? Is that a spiritual resurrection of them denying sin and following Christ? And... No, this is not. It's not talking about okay. a spiritual resurrection of them. No, it's talking about resurrection of people who have ended their physical mortal life. And judgment. Standard, so let's judgment. What is the standard doctrine on judgment for Christian church? What do we say? What do we talk about when we talk about judgment? Hell. God decides. Hell versus heaven, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. What's the criteria? What determines where you end up? Jesus. Faith in Christ Jesus gets you into this box here, right? That's pretty standard. Okay. So then when it says in the Bible, we must all stand before God's open seat to receive what is due for us or everything we've done in the body, whether good or bad, where does that fit in? The in between. There's no in between. I'm sorry, there's no in between. Somewhere in here, there's a few people that was they won't get to. Um, uh, second, second heaven, second heaven. Second heaven. Second heaven. Okay, what we've got on this side here, okay, we have every believer who is in heaven will then be judged according to their works to decide whether they will receive or what sort of reward. Remember, and it talks about those, everyone's work will be judged, whether they have built a solid foundation 
out of wood and stone or have that built with straw. And when the fire comes, it'll test your work. And if it survives, you'll receive a reward. And if it doesn't, uh, it'll all be burned up and you'll be saved as the sun who's just scraped in with smoke on their clothes, right? So, I actually, I've actually heard a joke about this. It's, it's very good. It's very good. So, a pastor and a taxi driver both die, go to judgment, go to heaven. They both get into heaven. They're both yes. Christians born again. And uh, they meet, like, St. Peter at the gates or whatever, as the joke yes. goes. And the pastor is taken to, like, a, a shack. Yes. Like a run down hunting cabin. It's like, what? What? Like, and, and, and he's so confused because the taxi driver got a mansion. Yes. And he was like, but I was a pastor. I was like, and he was like, yeah, but you, you save people one day. The taxi driver was working 24 7. Every, like, person who went into his cab was like, uh, he was evangelizing. Right, yes. Which is very good. Funny. So, and that is one of the standard teachings of. I, I, I butchered it. I, you yeah, tried to kill it, it, right? I yeah. butchered it. But it's, it's, it's good. But that is a true, that's one of Jesus' teachings, right? Because when we get to heaven, the judgments that are handed out will surprise a lot of people, right? The first will be last, the last will be first. Um, that very stand, very common um, thing that Jesus said was that what we can even look for, totally different to what God will be rewarding. In heaven, which will be interesting to find out. Someone did text me yesterday and ask me, is there rewards in heaven for looking after sick animals? <laughs> Do animals go to heaven? Do animals go to heaven? Here we go. Oh. <laughs> also, okay, so let's read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. I love that deflection. Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. This is staunch Hebrews. We might have to think about this for a minute. Go. And 10, 26 to 31. 10, 26 to 31, yeah. Patient endurance is what you need now, so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and promise. Ready? Where are we up to? 37. 26. Did you start at 26? Not bad. For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside God and Moses' eyes without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. So what is going on in this passage? Uh, it's talking about uh, people who have received faith and yes. knowledge of good and evil. Yes. And have walked into Christianity yes. and have left. And then right. turned their backs on God. Mm -hmm. And what does it say about them? There's a special kind of punishment. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is no way, is that what it says, that they can be brought back to God? God will, wow, this doesn't sound like Jesus. Wait, but then, come, like, let's say uh, for some example I walk away from God now mm -hmm. and then realize life is horrible without Jesus and I come back yes and I be born again yes again born again again born again again Sunday yes love that um does that mean that I'm still like not in is that <laughs> what this verse is saying what is this verse saying so this is a very strong passage right that um if we deliberately keep on sinning. So the first thing we need to understand, if we deliberately keep on sinning. Okay. So the person that is talking about is someone who is deliberately still sinning. So the situation you described is not someone who's deliberately still sinning. Because you've said, I've come back. 
Right, so it's kind of like a combination of both. You're in the faith, but you're still deliberately choosing to sing and have things in the world. While, is that what it's talking about? Is that what you mean? It's complicated, isn't it? Um, well, in this, in this, well, your example was if I'm if I'm away from God and then I come back, am I still not back? Okay, but in the, in the passage you're talking about, there's no coming back. So as soon as our, 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 our fundamental understanding is as soon as we turn back, we're welcomed back, right? And that's our oh, foundational... Yeah, if we don't turn back. As we don't turn back. Ah. If you people have a band, if you, and especially if, you, if, you, a band, if you've known Christ and then walked away and never come back, it's better off not to have known Christ at all. It's short. It be the, I guess it would be the short story because rejecting Moses got you in trouble, but rejecting Jesus... Having all the benefits of everything God's giving you, saying, yeah, nah, not interested in all that. Well, that's not um, that's not going to go well for you, mm. according to this passage. And there's several passages in Hebrews where there's quite firm. Um, are you what? Are you going to try and sacrifice Jesus again? That's not going to happen. It's a quite harsh on people that have turned away um, from God after they've known Him, and then it also will how well. If people know them, if they if you have tasted the power of the coming age and walked in the fullness of God's promise, and then you walk away. So um, that sort of thing. But now we'll go to that passage that Lauren tried to read us earlier, Hebrews 10, 35. Can I read it? Start at 35, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so do not throw away your confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that you have promised. For in just a little while, the coming month, Will, your coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous one will be by faith. Is that I, indented funny in your Bible? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a pet's old spoon, quite right there. And my righteous ones will be by faith, but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose soul the Lord is saved. Okay, and the next verse is? Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Okay, so we've had this big discussion. We've got a choice. Do we keep following God in faith or do we turn away? Turning away is bad for us. Following in faith will give us a reward. Um, and then he starts to say, we are not those people that turn away, but we are those that continue in faith. And that is the introduction to Hebrews chapter 11, which everyone knows Hebrews chapter 11 is all about faith. And faith. Slaughtered and the faith chapter... Of the, what, what they call the heroes of faith. Faith is, what is the definition of faith? From Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. The assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Hebrew is the assurance of things, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Then it lists a whole lot of examples of people that um, who had faith. And let's have a look at just one. Let's, what does it say about no one? No, well, that'll be in verse do, 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 do. No, no, seven. Very good. Okay. Um, Abraham, it says, he was called to go to a place that would later receive. He obeyed and went, even though he didn't know, know where he was going. Okay, who else is there? Let's have a look at. Um, oh, you can look at Enoch. What did Enoch do? He never died. He didn't, never died. That's right. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life. So, didn't they experience death? That's pretty cool. Okay, um, what else is there? There's another one that we would want to pick up. Okay. Abel, offered a Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. Um, Ah, by faith we understand the universe was formed at God's command, so what is seen was not made of what was visible. Okay, um, something that's a common theme through all of these things, faith it applies to things that can't be seen. All right? So Noah built an ark, we warned about things not yet seen. Abraham went to a country he had not seen. Um, Abel, how did Abel give a better gift? And there was no reason to know his gift was better except that he was being obedient to one that cannot be seen. Um, the whole, and so the essence of faith 
in Hebrews 11 is believing something we cannot see. Uh, and that's a, a foundational thing for us. Faith is putting your action, taking an action based on something where there's no, no obvious evidence. Uh, and that's the foundational, that what we call the step of faith or whatever, when there's no evidence, but still taking action on it. Now, we read in verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised, but they saw them from a distance. And we know um, in Joshua, what did the angel say to Joshua before he attacked the city? He said, look, I have given you the city. That's another example of seeing something that's not seeable. The angel was telling him to look at the city and see that God had already given it to him, even though it was all tightly shut up with walls around it. Um, faith is always involved seeing something that can't be seen. And then taking action as, as though it was real. So the, um, but, and so we have 39 to so 18, 13, we just said a lot of these people in the Old Testament never actually saw the goal of their faith. Abraham didn't receive what was promised, um, which is interesting because he received a son, but he never received the multitudes of descendants, all that sort of thing. These people were all living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things that were promised. Um, and we keep going on, verse 18 to 39, it's got a whole lot more people and the different examples of what was going on, Isaac blessed Jacob and he saw Jacob worshipped, Moses hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child. Okay, they saw something, I don't know what they saw, he was just a baby, but they saw something. By faith, all the things, everything that happened was by faith, blah, 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 blah. And if we go through the whole thing, the 39 and 40, it says these were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, they would be only together with us will be made perfect. So their faith is not fully rewarded in the Old Testament. No one ever received what they were promised. Only now do we get. Therefore, chapter 12, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, who is the cloud of witnesses? All the people in chapter 11 who believed and did not receive what they were believing for, that's our great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked for us, fixing our eyes, looking, seeing Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So we add, our model of faith is Jesus, who endured hardship for something that he couldn't, could not be seen, but he saw something invisible for the joy set before him. For the joy of seeing the salvation of the world, for all of that, he pushed through his hardship. So our goal is to stay in faith, continuing to walk in faith and not turning away from our faith in Jesus, despite whatever persecution or hardship is coming along to us, people of Hebrews, because just like Jesus, we can see something that's invisible. All those people in the Old Testament saw something that was invisible and they persevered on, regardless of the circumstances around them. That's the sort of faith that... Um, he is calling us to in the book of Hebrews. It's not quite the same as the faith for healing, right? Okay, because it's a different sort of faith. The faith in Hebrews 11 and 12 is faith that continues on when nothing is going right. That's a totally different type of faith to the faith that receives a miracle. Totally different type of faith. And we're called to walk in both realms of faith at the same time. There's the faith that receives a miracle. But that's not the Hebrews 11 faith. The Hebrews 11 faith is faith that didn't receive, but keeps on going. Um, and so that's the, I guess that's the difference. There's two types of faith going on, and we need to have the same type of faith at the same time. Both types of faith at the same time. I think we want to think about for a minute, before we move on from faith, what is the, um, the thing that you can't see that God is calling you to believe for right now, that you can't see? What is the thing? Because faith is believing something that can't be seen. So there's no point to believe that God will put you in a good church because you've already got one of those. There's no point to believe that God will put you in Bible college because you're already there. Okay? What is the what is the faith thing that God is calling you to believe that you can't see? That the only way you can see it is when you see it in the spirit, when you're in God's presence, then you can see it. But you can only see it in, in your heart. What's your faith thing that you are to walk after? And because when you know what that is, then your next step is to start acting as if you have received it. 
You start taking action as if that thing that you can't see is real. Noah saw rain that had never been seen, and so he built a boat. Because he saw rain, and no one knew what rain, no, rain had never, had never rained before. He saw rain, okay, he, he was warned about something not seen. And because of what he was warned about and hadn't been seen, he responded by building a boat. And so now when we, when God shows us something, that, that's something we're supposed to believe for, our next step is to respond as if that thing is already there. The rain's coming, start building the boat. That would be the, whatever, whatever it is, that God's putting into your life, whatever it is that's your faith goal, when, once you can articulate what it is, that's the invisible thing that you're believing for, then what you do is you start acting as if you have received it. You start living like it's yours. Uh, Abraham left his country and went to another land. This is where I live now. Even though he was had no land there, he was never had any possession or anything, but he lived there because this is my land. And that was his, that was his faith, his faith expectation. This is where I'm going to stay regardless of how bad it gets, because this is the promised land. This is the promise that God has given me. So that's, that's a, a faith moment just to think about. Let's think about what is our faith possession that we are possessing. We will finish the book of Hebrews right there. Um, I think that's it. Like Unlike every other book, it doesn't have a whole lot of greetings. And it, everything that has a few comments like Timothy is coming to see you soon, but that's about it. Um, <clears throat> we'll finish it there. We are now in fact two thirty. We'll stop the recording right now. And at two thirty, we will have Helen's New Testament presentation.